Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 741. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's July 12th, 2022. Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. We are glad you could be here to watch us pontificate on Anglican events around the world. We've had two real big events. We've had the General Synod and the Episcopal Church's General uh, Convention to talk about. So just sit down, put a seatbelt on. There's a lot to talk about. It's best to watch this show if you have airbags. So we'll get on to that in a second. George, how are you doing this week? I've been at General Convention <laughs> remotely. <laughs> they, uh, they've, cl they've closed it uh, this year. They shortened it from about 12, 10 to 12 days. Uh, 10 days down to four days uh, they've closed it to outsiders because of COVID concerns everybody's masked everybody has to show proof of vaccinations and boosters and you and I Kevin early on decided it wasn't worth putting the money out because everything can be seen via live video link and so for the past since Friday of last week I've been either watching general convention or general synod or working at church on Sunday so it's been a roller coaster week for me i mean you can watch a train wreck in person or you can watch a train wreck in high definition streamed over the internet and uh, you've chosen to do the streaming over the internet uh, and it has been a train wreck uh first story we posted was the house of deputies have voted to condemn crisis pregnancy centers now how could that be I thought they were pro-choice, and in this world we know there, there's pro-abortion or pro-choice and pro-life. And to be pro to be pro-choice, George, don't you have to honor both sides of the the ar argument? Uh, no, no. I, I thought for sure well, pro-choice means allowing people to choose life if they if they so desired. Uh, pro-choice means uh, do it my way or die. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah what death. we had here. Uh, this didn't arise in isolation. Uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts and other and Planned Parenthood have been on a campaign for the past few months to shut down crisis pregnancy centers. They claim that crisis pregnancy centers give out false information, that they're not medically qualified, and that they are telling lies about abortion. So Warren and her minions are seeking to destroy the opposition. Well, a deputy from Ohio essentially took Warren's talking points and press points and wrote it up as a resolution convention. And the resolution did two things. It apologized for the 1994 support General Convention gave to crisis pregnancy centers and then urged condemnation of current crisis, crisis pregnancy centers. Well, this was a, a resolution put forward. And the general convention, because it had a shorter conve short convention time frame, put over 400 items on what they call the consent calendar. The people who manage resolutions basically said, these are things that are non-controversial, like we wish Fred Jones a happy 99th birthday type resolutions. And global we'll warming, this on the settled calendar. science, we don't have to discuss it, yes. Well, in the past, it only took three uh, deputations, in other words, three dioceses in the, gen in the House of Deputies to say, no, 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 we don't want to go that route. This time, they changed the rules to a third, from a three to a third. So essentially, the liberals who control everything in general convention, but especially the dispatch of business committee, could force through the social agenda, social rights things on the consent calendar. So this was put through. Now, a deputy from Tennessee on the first day, a priest deputy, a woman, stood up and said, no, we need to debate this. And she couldn't get a third of the general convention to back her on that. So it passed. Well, on uh, Saturday, was it Saturday or Sunday? On, at the end of convention, this went to the House of Bishops. And the House of Bishops said, whoa, 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 because I think the stink that arose after that and I have to say that the stink, because, well, first off, there was no secular press there. The only outsiders, 
was the Baltimore Sun on the first day to write about, you know, Shriners come to Baltimore. <laughs> Shriners. <laughs> <laughs> the news coverage was all church news, diocesan publications, the Living Church, Anglican Inc. And Anglican Inc. was the one, the only one who picked this up. Also, Jeff Walton of IRD sure. uh, picked this up. And I think there must have been some feedback because when the, this came to the bishops, the bishops said, whoa, 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 we got to talk about this. And Dan, uh, Michael Smith, the Bishop of Albany, whom we have, uh, provisional Bishop of Albany, whom we've kitted on this show in the past, uh, we have to say that, put forward a substitute resolution. And the substitute resolution basically said, uh, mm, we're not gonna condemn, we're going to applaud the work of, of uh, pregnancy crisis centers, but we do condemn if anybody who lies to women about abortion and pregnancy. Um, well, my, uh, Mark Hollingsworth, the Bishop of Ohio stood up and said, well, this came out of my diocese and the stuff that I've been shown shows that these pregnancy crisis centers are real cesspits of lies, tricking these poor girls from going and getting abortions, telling them all these horror stories about the uh, medical risks and this and that. And interesting, and then we had a bunch of women bishops get up and tell personal anecdotes. Uh, Bishop of Arizona, well, I was assaulted when I was a young girl and I was taken to a Catholic hospital which wouldn't perform of this and that. Uh, and so it turned into a women's issue so that the men bish male bishops couldn't really talk because my lived experience of having had this problem 50 years ago, 40 years ago, is more valuable to the debate than your theological considerations or the truth about pregnancy crisis centers. Mm -hmm. But Ann Hodges Koppel, who's the bishop suffragan of New North Carolina, got up and said, I ran a uh, battered women's shelter for many years, and I did send there some pregnancy crisis centers that did wonderful work. And then there were a few that weren't so great. But I think we're wasting our time because this there's such a lack of subtlety in this resolution, such a lack of detail, and that this doesn't add anything to the work of the church. It only subtracts and the bishops shot down the resolution on uh, pre pregnancy crisis centers because of the intervention, intervention of a woman bishop from North Carolina who basically said, look, this is not as simple, you know. Essentially, she said without saying the names, we shouldn't ape the Democratic Party and Elizabeth Warren and basically carry their water for them. We should be Christians and see that this is a complex issue and there are good and bad in a lot of these institutions. So the bishops pulled the fat out of the fire, if you will, on the last day. Yeah, there, and I'll be completely honest, there are, and I'm not gonna say pregnancy crisis centers, but there are some uh, pro-life entities that are a little bit more aggressive and more coarse than they need to be. Operation Rescue would be one of them. Um, where they're there to uh, show you all the disgusting pictures and try and scare you out of an abortion, where there's a lots of great uh, pregnancy centers that just give you the facts and the truth and, and still make our pro-choice. They give you the choice, but they want to be sure you have the information before you make that choice. Where the left doesn't want you to have any information. They don't want you to have the ultrasounds. They don't want you to have any knowledge of what is forming in the womb. They just want to be sure that you know they get their uh, six hundred dollars for the uh, the abortion. So, um, Kevin, I think I think you hit on it. it. It's follow the money. Yeah. You know, Planned Parenthood doesn't give away abortions for free. You've got to pay for them. And the whole pregnancy crisis center is for free. Free. You get, I mean, it's not, and it's not just uh, sort of preventing the. But it, they're not so much uh, uh, pro birth as they are pro life. In other words, the, I'm involved with the pregnancy crisis center here in our little county. The vast majority of the money they spend, and they give away for free, are diapers, parenting classes, baby formula, basically mm -hmm. helping the parent, the mother, after the child is born, not 
And then they have the medical facilities to do ultrasounds to show you the baby as it's in utero. Um, so you're absolutely right, Kevin. It's a follow the money thing. I, at the end of the day. Um, well, on Facebook, when we started to post the Anglican Inc. story talking about uh, what happened in the, the House of Deputies, you, people were saying, this is like a bloodlust. Why does the Episcopal Church lust for the death of children? And I'm like, I can't, I can't defend the Episcopal Church. I'm, you know, how it's how? not so much the Episcopal Church as it's the Episcopalians in charge of the Episcopal okay. Church. In other words, it's it's like having a, oh, a bad government. You're still loyal to your government, even though you hate what they do. Um, an extreme example would be, let's say you are a German in Nazi Germany. I mean, uh, do you support the killing Jews? No, you don't. But the people who do, who run the country are, or you're anti-war during the Vietnam War. Um, it's, but you are all right, Kevin, it's a tremendous shame and stain and blot on the honor of the church that its institutions are so corrupt and so fallen mm -hmm. and so captured by the spirit of the age. And okay, the bloodlust of the age. and here's, here's the zeitgeist uh, part two transgenderism they fully support transgendered at any age on demand so that was another a, one a, of these a, consent things a, a seven-year-old goes and says i think today i want to be a boy they set up the hormone therapy they set up the surgery selection and th the episcopal church is okay with that again it's the general convention not the Episcopal Church. The General Convention is, gives an opinion on a certain point. It didn't, doesn't change the prayer book. It doesn't change the canons on this point. Mm -hmm. But how this occurred was, again, this was on the consent calendar. There are 400 other things. And the, the, the small conservative minority that is left in the General Convention has to choose their shots. And they couldn't get this off the consent calendar because the pregnancy crisis center fight was one that they had that they had to pick which fight to do, and they chose the pregnancy crisis center battle. Hmm. Um, is it right that that's how this happened? No, it's not right. It, if there had been a full debate, would they still have backed it? Probably, but it's just the sort of the leisure domain that you see from the liberal the loony left who control these institutions. And again, it's who control the institution. The Pew, uh, Pew people who do, uh, sorry, the Gallup people who do the surveys find that the Episcopal Church's people in the pews mirror the United States population in terms of political uh, stance. It's not all hard left. Oh, Hold the on a second. If, you, if they mirror, then that means 51% voted for Trump uh, in 2016, probably. Wow! Uh, they, because they mirror the, the 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 Episcopal Church is no really not that much different politically than the United States as a whole. It has a higher socioeconomic status, mm -hmm. that you know, but as a whole, these are what the these are what the results of the Gallup polls have shown all these years. Mm -hmm. The difference is the disconnect and the anti-democratic way the church functions. For example, the diocese of my diocese may have, uh, I don't know, 15,000 people. Uh, diocese of Northern Michigan may have 750 people. My diocese has equal weight in the House of Bishops and the House of Deputies. How is that remotely? Diocese of Texas has 100,000 people. They have the same voice and vote as the diocese of uh, North Dakota with a thousand. Wow. Just going to say it's so, crazy. Well, now, let's not just spend all our time on the Episcopal Church. Uh, well, Church we do have a few other things I do want to touch on that because it is, uh, I think we really do need to demonstrate why this is so crazy. I mean, okay. uh, cool. we, uh, abortion on demand um, at any time, meaning up to, uh, up to birth, was passed again by consent, with no debate. Uh, the bishops spent their last afternoon on climate change, which 
which I know is really a vital issue for me. Uh, where they want to, we're going to set up a truth and reconciliation committee for church boarding schools for American Indians in the 19th and early 20th century. I don't mind if they waste their time on that. Yeah, of all the things that they could be doing, go go do that, <laughs> please. But the thing is, a truth and reconciliation commission starts out with let's find the truth. <laughs> the Episcopal Church's truth and reconciliation commission has already picked out a villain, that's, that's and it's going to basically beat itself to death with, you know, it's what the Canadian church has gone through. Uh, you know, they were a generation ahead. Yeah. And uh, the other one is Barbara Harris added to the uh, uh, calendar of lesser feasts and fasts. Um, Barbara Harris was the first woman bishop in the Anglican Communion. She was a deeply unpleasant person. Uh, uh, yeah, we well, say let, that from personal knowledge. Yeah, personal I mean, well, yeah, personally, yeah, absolutely. Uh, of all the attributes Titus calls for to be a bishop, she had none. So. Well, I remember she, you know, I, in front of me in, uh, uh, where were we, Columbus, Ohio, she, uh, you know, I don't know her to talk to her, but I've been around these things long enough, I, you know, calling John David Schofield an asshole, okay, uh, at Lambeth 98, the Africans are only voting this way because they're being given chicken dinners, uh, these dumb Africans are being bribed. Uh, yeah. deeply, That's deeply, the barber. It, yeah. you know, if assholes were airports, if were, you know, assholes were airports, this place before, this is how she talks. Now, for some people on the left, this was refreshing and this and that. Well, I, I didn't share, see that charisma of Episcopacy. Well, the, uh, Diocese of Massachusetts and the Liberal Caucus has all wanted to make this woman a saint, uh, in the lesser feasts and fake, you know, not a real saint but commemorate her life and her witness, as they say. Well, again, Michael Smith of Albany stepped in and saved the day. Uh, got to hand it to the guy. He knew, knows the system. He said, well, the rule is that we don't celebrate anybody for 50 years at, until they, after their death so that we can get a long view of their life. The only time we've not done this is if Martin Luther King Jr understandable I can see yeah. and oscar romero the bishop from el salvador i can see i can see yeah. uh the the flying assholes woman mm. he said why don't we commemorate her consecration it's, in other words just like we commemorate uh the consecration of samuel seabury the first american bishop without con without commemorating samuel seabury we can commemorate her consecration as the first woman bishop without commemorating her. And this got the people who didn't want to stand up and say, oh, this woman is a harridan, off the hook. And so the bishops were able to sort of finagle this and get it through. And the, and the deputies said, oh, well, all right, I guess so. So Barbara Harris's consecration will soon make its way into the book of lesser feasts and fasts without having to commemorate Barbara Harris. Well, they, they took one out too. Oh yes, Samuel Portia Duvose. Mm -hmm. He probably was the greatest theologian the Episcopal Church has ever produced. He was, unfortunately for him, a chaplain in the Confederate Army. The, uh, then went to teach theology at Swanee, uh -huh. and then was the dean of the school of Swanee. Activists have decided to cancel him because he never apologized for the fact that he came from a wealthy family that owned 200 plus slaves, nor did he ever say the civil, the South was wrong for seceding from the Union. This is a perfect example of screwy historical thinking of not looking at the context and looking at the time uh, and saying, you know, when we posted this on Anglican Inc., uh, Fanwell, uh, our friend, the Bishop of Upper Malawi, wrote, this is a terrible decision. And then uh, Bill Machombo, the Bishop of Eastern Zambia, and a whole slew of African bishops, uh, you know, chimed in saying, yes, you have to judge people by their time and place 
not by the standards that we have today. So here we have uh, three or four African bishops writing on Anglican's Facebook page saying getting rid of William Portia DuBose because he was a confederate is asinine. It's non-historical thinking. It isn't. But the problem the current zeitgeist have, the spirit of the day is guilty by association. Mm-hmm. And DeVoe was guilty by association. He did not own slaves, but he did not condemn it. And in that age of th- two, three hundred, four hundred years ago, it was not frequent that you would see people condemn it uh, who lived in the South. Because uh, they didn't want to be a person uh, under fire or cancellation in the South, so to speak. Well, let's say we do get Barbara Harris eventually into the calendar as saints, as a person, not just a commemoration. Sure. In a hundred years' time, are we going to kick her out because she was a uh, very vociferous abortion activist? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, applying standards like that, uh, it's just bad thinking. It is bad thinking because there probably is coming a time... Uh, because the science on when life starts is is clear uh mm-hmm. you know there's coming a time where uh we may be a pro-life world uh just but what we know and by how we can treat uh pregnancies so how are well, we going to treat people who were pro-abortion are we going to treat them like the slave owners of the 18th century well, demography is destiny. If the pro-abortion people keep getting them vasectomies and abortions, we'll outpopulate the uh, those side. No, we're up to, I, we're, I do want to read. Well, the, they just said we're up to eight billion people now. In my lifetime, we've gone from six billion to eight billion. Wow. So, but and all that, of them seem to have cell phones too. <laughs> yeah, uh, that, that that doesn't mean you know uh, white Caucasians in America are increasing. It just means that uh, uh, the globe is in, in, increasing. I wanted to add one little closing note, if I may, on the convention. Mm-hmm. Kevin Martin is the former dean of Dallas uh, mm-hmm. and is a noted uh, church growth expert. Uh, I had him in my parish here about six, seven years ago to give us a pointer on how to grow the parish. And we followed his advice and it worked. Uh, He wrote this on his Facebook page, Kevin on Congregations. And his observation is the General Convection took no action that would change the current trends in declining membership, attendance, adult baptism, and stewardship when measured against inflation. Hence, if these trends continue, I have these predictions. This was the 80th General Convention. There won't be a 90th. The next presiding bishop who follows Michael Curry will be the last presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church as we know that office today. The church's budget and resources will continue to shrink, forcing restructuring of staff and ministries, and the House of Bishops will shrink in size over the next two decades to half its size today. General Convention did nothing to address the elephant in the room, uh, nothing to put out the fire. Think of whatever uh, cliche you want to use. Instead, well, it talked. It spent its time talking about abortion and pregnancy centers and Barbara Harris and Indian schools. If the trajectory of the Anglican Communion changes and the leadership uh, falls into uh, somebody from an African nation, not just the uh, uh, the head for the uh, Canterbury, yeah, that's a possibility because I could not imagine the Episcopal Church even being invited at an ec- ecumenical level. Mm-hmm. To an Anglican event, if the leadership had changed uh, at the top, how, you know, how would you invite the Church of Canada, uh, even at the you know, at that level, to an event in the Anglican Church? <laughs> right now, we're going to talk about the Church of England. How would they even be invited at an ecumenical level to an Anglican event? So, let's move on here to the Church of England. Uh, they're having their synod, and biggest news: upside down manager. They, the, the Church of England Synod is a, does, works very differently from the General Convention. They have a set number of issues that they discuss, but they also have something called written questions where members of Synod may ask the church leadership questions. And this is where the real fun, fun can be found. Um, let me pull this up. Uh, well, a, a professor uh, who uh, 
a, a, member, a lay member of Synod asked this question. In 1959, there were, I'm going to give you round numbers, there were 13,000 clergy in uh, last, this year there are 7,000 clergy. The number uh, of people th went... Th th for people watching, that's a shrinkage. There were 2 million people on Sunday in the church in 59. Today, there's 700,000 people in the church on Sunday. In 59, there were 600 and, uh, I'm sorry, 250 support staff across the church. Today, there's 6,500. What is the church going to do about the growth of support staff, ecumenical officers, women's advisors, the, the, the drones in the back offices. The people they're have... All, there are only a thousand more clergy than there are... A thousand more parish priests than there are drones. But here, if you have the budget for all that middle management, don't you have the budget, if you shrunk the middle management, to fill in full-time clergy all the churches? Yeah, you do. And the, we, we ran an op-ed from one of the leaders of the Save the Parish campaign um, Marcus Walker, who pointed out that the Church of England has put hundreds of millions of pounds into these growth initiatives over the years, and and according to the results they publish, it works out to about thirteen thousand pounds a person added to the church. Wow! And thirteen thousand pounds is roughly what the stipend of a curate is. What if that money was taken out of funding? the back offices and the staff and put into funding frontline clergy because every reputable study I've ever read about church growth is that it happens at at the front lines it doesn't happen at the bishop's office it doesn't happen at the national offices it happens with your local minister your local parish priest your local youth minister your local whatever it is it doesn't happen in the back office. And what if that money was redirected? Would we see a different Church of England? And I'm confident people would. Mm -hmm. but, uh, wow. but Kevin, we're, we're, saving, we're saving one of the best for last, uh, oh. well, which is the Church of England is now having trouble defining what a woman is. Uh, so somebody got asked the, the trick question and they blew it. Now, yeah, this is the... the, the the zeitgeist of the day, the spirit of the day, is completely trying to redefine or undefine uh, principles of creation. And so a bishop gets asked, what is a woman? Simple answer, female human. Not so simple for him. Well, a man named Adam Kendry who is a representative from the armed forces, uh, I think he's in the Navy, asked, and I really think it was a gotcha question. I think he just wanted to ask a question to, to make a point. And the question asked, what is the Church of England's definition of a woman? It's a written question. And the chairman of the Faith and Order Commission, Bishop Robert Innes, who's the bishop in Europe, wrote, there is no official definition which reflects the facts until fairly recently definitions of this kind were thought to be self-evident as reflected in the marriage liturgy. However, we've begun to explore the complexities associated with gender identity and points to the need for additional care and thought to be given in understanding our commonalities and differences as people made in the word nature God. I mean, I, the, the poor Bishop of Europe, he had time to think about this. It was a written answer. And he basically set himself up to be made the brunt of jokes. Even the, is it the Babylon Bee? Kevin, you sent me oh, an yeah. article. Babylon Bee caught on to it. Or, you know, anybody who has any brains about what's going on in this woke world pointed out to this article or wrote about this article. Yeah. Oh, my. Um, but, well, at least the Church of England's General Synod gets noted by the secular press. Not for good things they do, but for the stupidities. The General Convention still hasn't come up on the radar of the national news media. Kevin, do you remember when we were there, they would have CNN, trucks, and BBC, ABC, NBC, CBS. Yeah, all, right. yeah. all the, Everybody would be there. 
today it's uh, it's George and uh, Episcopal Life uh, and uh, the Living Church, and that's it's well, sad. Yeah, yeah, Jonathan mentioned. Now I think the BBC is required to tape uh, the Synod, uh, so they'll mm-hmm. be there. But they're not sending news reporters or journalists uh, to these events anymore, and that's because the voice of the Church of England and the voice of uh, the Episcopal Church have no relevance anymore in our society. Nobody cares what they think. Well, I know the English press pretty well, okay. and they used to have specialist religion journalists for the sure. newspapers. Yeah, Ruth Gladhill. Uh, like people, yes, yeah, like Ruth Gladhill at the mm-hmm. Times. Nowadays, they put the most junior reporters on it. They don't have specialist religion reporters. Well, some of them do, but they're not people who've spent a whole career in religious journalism and know the subjects matter. And so we're seeing people without any subject matter knowledge reporting for many newspapers and networks in England on these issues. Um, and one of the problems is that means that they don't really, they don't, they pick up on basically a good joke. What is a woman? That's, you know, that fiasco was fun. But for instance, there was a, a question about the Anglican mission in England. What is our relationship? What is our understanding? What is, how do we look at them? And the Bishop of Fulham responded that, well, they're not really Anglicans. We just, you know, sort of ignore them. That's more important religion news, I think, than that the Church of England can't make up its mind what a girl is. Um, well, but, but, but if you asked a bishop in the AMIE what a, a woman is, you would have an answer and they would not skirt around the issue, I hope. Please don't, don't give the English answer here. This is simple because people are looking for churches that have the answers, not for churches that avoid answers, not for churches that avoid the hard questions. The church right now would have its influence back if it were willing to speak the truth, if it would make its yeses yeses and its noes noes. And if you're, if you're unwilling to do that, the zeitgeist of this age will eat you alive. Shall we move on to Sri Lanka? Yes, Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka. I want. I well, want. I'll, I'll, let me intro this real quickly here. We've been told for twenty years, thirty years, forty years that the world is ending, and that we as human beings need to change our conduct, not just at the personal level, not just me recycling a can into the garbage. Not just me taking a, a special garbage can labeled recycle to the to the dump, uh, that we have to do this at the government level. That this will only work if we change everything to solar, if we change everything to wind power, if we dump coal and nuclear, it's the only way we can get out of this because the air is full of carbon. Not really, but it's, it's certainly full of humidity. And so uh, some nations have decided to listen to this and do everything they can to uh, be leaders in green. Sri Lanka is one of the most famous. What happened, George? Last year, the government of Sri Lanka announced that it was going to be the first fully organic farming nation. They banned the import of uh, uh, fertilizer which is made from nitrates and, you know, it's a chemical process. Sri Lanka has had a tough few years because of tourism was a big part of its economy and with COVID that died out. With uh, they, big part of their economy is remittances from workers overseas. Well, COVID sort of killed that as well. The other big aspect is tea and rice and it's a beautiful, idyllic place. Um, you basically can grow anything there. But the government said, okay, we're gonna go green. We're going to follow the World Economic Forum advice. We've been invited to Davos. We've hear, heard all the smart people tell us this is the way forward. The result has been that uh, crop yields on rice and tea, uh, bananas, the major export products all fell in half. And the government had to spend money that it used to get by exports, it now has to spend the few the dollar reserves it has to buy fuel, uh, for buy food, 
uh, in March, the government announced that the exams, year-end national exams, would be canceled because they couldn't afford paper and ink for the students to take exams. And in a space of six months, Sri Lanka went from a growing middle-class country, you know, where you think about college, you think about your vacation, you know, you're, you know, you have your house and your car and this and that. For many, many people, to where am I going to find food tonight? Uh, there is no fuel in Sri Lanka right now. The economy is shut down. The power is out 15 hours a day, and it's getting worse. And this past weekend, uh, last week, the uh, Anglican bishops called for the government to step down because of its terrible mismanagement. Catholic Church and the Buddhists of all sort of, if everybody stopped fighting each other over religion and united against this government, and last, uh, I think it was Saturday, uh, the mob stormed the presidential palace and the president was filmed getting on a naval warship with all these suitcases stuffed with something and fleeing the country. Um, the green agenda has been tried in Sri Lanka and it has led to the collapse of society. It's now a country in anarchy, without food, without fuel, without paper and ink. Uh, and with no way to get the dollars to buy this thing. Nobody wants the rupee uh, because it's essentially worthless. So we're soon going to see U.S. Navy ships and British ships coming up into port with boatloads of rice and uh, things to keep the country alive until the next growing season. It's an utter fiasco of the I, I think you, I think you're looking at this wrong, George. Surely this will help the temperatures from stopping their increase. It's worth it to, to uh, uh, destroy your economy if you're going to save the planet, George. You, you're looking at this completely from the wrong mindset. Shiraka has sacrificed themselves to save the planet, and they should be honored. They made it all the way to 2022 uh, for, well. for their sacrifice. <laughs> Well, it's like the uh, senator from Michigan uh, who said people should, should just buy Teslas and not worry about the price of gas. Nope. <sighs> uh, my goodness. I mean, we're in Marie Antoinette, let them eat cake, which I know is not a true thing, but it's, it's that just, mindset of the elites. Uh, uh, you know, uh, It, we see this happening in ne Netherlands right now. This is a majorly underreported story. The government has announced that they're going to follow the World Economic Forum guidelines on, on nitrogen and EU guidelines, which means they're going to uh, get rid of 30% of the farms and cut back on what how you can farm. Well, the Dutch Holland is one of the major agricultural exporting nations on earth. They're very good at farming. It's very high tech. Uh, you know, you see these fields of tulips. Well, besides tulips, they do a lot more. Well, the government has now threatening to uh, confiscate 30% of the land. Uh, the, uh, there was a, there's a plan to resettle some uh, migrants, illegal aliens on land confiscated from farmers and Essentially, we're seeing the forced collective, we're seeing the, the repeat of the 20s in the Soviet Union again, of independent farmers being forced from their lands and having to get taken over by the state. Um, it's, and the farmers in Poland and Italy and other places are joining forces against the government and the EU and all this green agenda. Yeah. Uh, it's, we're in the United States, uh, if you look, if you go do deep dive into the news, and I mean, we're in an agricultural part of Florida, Kevin and I are when you're down here. And on our cable system, we get the Rural Farmers Network channel, which I never watch. But if I am going through the channels and I stop there by accident, uh, because I can't be bothered to lean forward more to get better uh, clickability, you'll read about farmers in Florida, basically saying my fertilizer prices have doubled in the last year. Mm -hmm. And I I bought last year, but I've got to buy this year, which means in a year's time, the next crop that's coming out, 
whether it's peanuts or oranges or whatever, you know, it's going to be horrendously more expensive because the costs we have to pass on to the consumer. And we're not really hearing that, I think, in our mainstream media. No, no, the, the, the Sri Lanka story is, a, is a, a blackout. I don't see it anywhere. You know, I can read about it here and there in some articles by uh, third-party journalists, but uh, you're not seeing this on the MSNBC, the uh, CNNs of the world, because it is an indictment of their thinking as to how we should spend our money and our time on future projects. Uh, Germany is suffering. Germany is a great example of the failure of solar and wind power because they have made the most commitment to switch over the quickest of any European country. The second Russia says we're going to turn off the gas because we want to have a war with Ukraine and you're not supporting us, Germany has no power. Their energy uh, um, costs have gone through the roof because wind and solar is not making up for the the, uh, the lack of gas. And we're, we're just seeing this, this mindset of if it's green, it's good. If it's green, it can be good. But green does not automatically mean good. And uh, uh, if you want to survive as a country, you're going to have to uh, invest in nuclear power. Nuclear power in 2022 is so much safer uh, than it was in the 70s. We now have uh, smaller plants that produce much more kilowatt hours uh, than any before. And it's a completely different makeup of how the radiation uh, is used to heat steam. It's not something where you're dropping cores in anymore. It's 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 changed, and we won't use it because it's guilty by association. Okay, you lose. Kevin, you and I grew up in the 70s, and uh, our understanding of green, I think, was formed at that time. Basically, we both would watch the uh, commercials of that with... Uh, William Cannon's voice, people can, you know, with yeah. uh, pollution, and then the Indian with the tear, uh, look, as people yes. throwing garbage out of their car windows, yeah. people can cause pollution, people can stop pollution. And for us, that's green. In other words, give a hoot, don't pollute, as is Woodsy yeah. told us in elementary school. Uh -huh. Green doesn't mean that anymore. Green means authoritarianism. It means taking people's land, ordering your life. It's not for us our generation uh what comes after uh are we generation x or what generation uh, are we well, I, technically i'm generation uh yuppie but i'm right between boomer and x i'm, I'm okay. 1965 you're 1962 you're a boomer okay well <laughs> we're, we're on the cups uh the uh, the our understanding of green is very different from what the modern understanding of green. Mm -hmm. And so when you ask in general, are you in favor of green policies? We all say, sure. Who, who likes, who doesn't want to, you know, have polluted uh, rivers and uh, polluted air? Mm -hmm. That's not what we're talking about anymore. No. We're the, talking the, about a reordering of the economy and having the elites tell us what to do. Um, and there's no downside for the elites. They're still going to be in their mansions in Nantucket and Oahu. Uh, and because they're building up on the top of the diamond head, they're not going to worry about global uh, flooding and everything. Well, I think the green is the new totalitarians, too. I mean, mm -hmm. they're the people who will tell you what to do. And if you don't do it, you don't get to participate in society. You don't get to participate in commerce. It's right now here in America, the West, and Europe. If you don't participate and raise the, the pride flag during June, you will be scorned as a company. And uh, the companies are afraid to be scorned. They don't want to be canceled. And that same type of fear is used in green. So where we had the, uh, um, the crying Indian, that's a long time ago. We now have the... Uh, the 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 modern communism is the enforcement of green yeah so i i uh as an aside um yeah. in some respects the environmental movement has always been helped along by a bit of fraud 
the crying Indian was an, actually an FBI, a full-blooded Italian. <laughs> he wasn't an Indian. <laughs> he was an actor from New Orleans. <laughs> he was an Italian, not an Indian. He played uh, a very good they, Indian, though. I remember he was he walking He played a great the, Indian, yes. The, he was the, Sicilian. I mean, yeah, uh, the New Jersey Turnpike area there where they had all those dumps and you could see all the toxic yeah. stuff going in the air. And that's back in the day of, of acid rain. And he just mm -hmm. stood there. Somebody threw a little uh, McDonald's bag out of their car, and he cried. And it got me. We don't. And and in America, we don't pollute that way. We don't throw stuff out of the windows. I was in Israel uh, talking to my tour guide ten years ago. I said, "Why is there so much trash and stuff all over the roads here?" He said, "Because we don't have crying Indians on our TV." <laughs> yes, he said that. He said, "Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah." So you know, it's it's how your society is raised, um, and we were raised from an early uh, identity in the '60s, thanks to Captain Kangaroo, going way back, and, and others, not to pollute, and we don't. And so let's move on uh, to some more uh, religious news. Let's talk about uh, Bishop Elect Charlie Holt, and uh, there's much more to talk about here, George. The left is out to get Charlie Holt. There was a resolution presented to General Convention to essentially condemn his election. Uh, it was clothed in the terms of, oh, we need to have equal rights between clergy voters and lay voters and this and that. But the, the bishops declined to hear it, so it didn't go anywhere. But in talking to the people in the Diocese of Florida, we've discovered that there was a plan ahead of time to make sure Charlie Holt wasn't elected bishop. Uh -huh. And it was by the left. And they were shocked that Charlie Holt was elected. And since his election, there has been nonstop work to derail it, uh, soliciting standing committees across the Episcopal Church to block it, to resolutions to general convention. We had the cathedral uh, and its dean uh, announced that they would now, they were now an affirming parish and they would do gay marriages. Well, the Diocese of Florida has a protocol how you go about doing this, and you tell the bishop your plans ahead of time. They surprise Sam Howard by this and basically are throwing down a gauntlet to Charlie Holt, should he be made bishop, to know that his opposition will come from the cathedral mm -hmm. and from all these other churches. So it, <sighs> this is the Episcopal Church at its nastiest. In other words, not uh, fall, not allowing the spirit to lead and guide them, but allowing political agendas to guide them. And I just pray for Charlie Holt that uh, he remains strong in these character assassinations that are being launched against him. Well, when we saw you know other uh, bishops thrown down after their election, the diocese was the supporting entity in this diocese of South Carolina, Mark Lawrence. It's a different situation, but the diocese re-elected him and they were supporting of him. I don't see the diocese at very many levels here supporting Charlie Holt. They're working against well, Bishop, him. Well, Bishop Sam Howard is working for him. Uh -huh. And I think if there were an election today, he would be re-elected. Okay. The problem is that there are influential leaders of the diocese who know how to work the system who are on the left who are uh, leading this charge against Charlie. It's the same way General Convention, where a very, very, very small, hard left group control the machineries of machinery of power so that they're able to basically do what they want. I read that he was, the, the three candidates were separated in rooms so that they could. Yes, uh, I, I think there were, there were five candidates, uh -huh. I think, five candidates. And they were each kept in separate rooms during the vote. This sort of foiled the plans, as I have been told, of the left because they were all going to drop out and coalesce behind one person if it looked if like Charlie, yeah. uh, if Charlie was getting ahead. But they didn't know what the results were. And so they, didn't, they couldn't organize and effectively coalesce behind one candidate to block Charlie Hope. So I'm told. So the... But... but Maybe it was an act of the spirit. Maybe just the the regular good old Episcopal pew setters who came to that convention responded with their hearts and didn't care what the smart people said, and Charlie was elected. Hmm. But it is. But this whole process has had a major effect on other conservative conservative dioceses, 
who are going through the selection process because they're saying, look, we can't pick a conservative because we're wasting our time. Uh, it'll get blocked. We don't have to go through again. We don't want to go through what Albany is going through in South Carolina and now Florida. Let's just go along to get along. That's one of the things I'm seeing. All right. Let's uh, go. We got a, three more stories we got to hit really fast. We got 10 minutes left. Let's talk about uh, Lambeth Chief of Staff. Uh, it's something we talked about last week on Anglican Scripted. And surprise, Lambeth Palace and the Church House seem to watch our show. We did a story on Anglican Inc. about uh, Ijeoma Ajabade, who's the new Chief of Staff at Lambeth Palace. We ran the press release. And then one of our viewers contacted us with uh, photos of her tweets and Facebook pages. And at looking that this woman is out there. Uh, she's she is politically far left. Hard left. Yes. Far left. Yeah. She's so glad she didn't get this one job because a former conservative prime minister is the patron of this trust that she was going to work for. Oh, she couldn't abide that. She's pro abortion, pro gay rights, pro woke, uh, pro woke, anti Donald Trump, uh, I mean in a nasty sort of way. Uh, and anti-Church of Nigeria. She's a Nigerian woman. She's on the hard left. Now, we pointed all this out in our little thing, say, and we had a, it was a news analysis saying, we see the direction in which Lambeth Palace is going. Its chief of staff is going to pull the archbishop to the far left. And Lambeth Palace wrote a rejoinder to our story saying, no, 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 no. Uh, we have people of all political persuasions. Left uh, and hard left. <laughs> yeah, left and hard left <laughs> at Lambeth Palace. And they, they come from a wide variety, left and hard and left, hard left yes. of uh, perspectives, <laughs> political views, and church traditions. Uh, so essentially, they didn't deny anything that we said, but rather they sort of uh, show that they backed her. Yeah. And the result was that uh, Ijeoma Ajibade then closed down her tweet account to nobody can view it if you're not uh, one of her friends. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so Whatever. Yeah. she she yeah. learned her uh but what is what is it you know your hires I think tell a lot about you. Oh, absolutely. And the Archbishop mm -hmm. of Canterbury, you know the, Oh, last year, remember, Kevin, we reported about the man in charge of the selection process of bishops is a partnered gay man whose life, uh, who, who is, in a, and is in a form of marriage that the Church of England rejects. He's in charge of picking bishops. Yeah. The hard left is now the chief of staff. Which way is Justin going? Well, we know which way the tracks are being laid and the direction that's going. All right, let's finish up here. Uh, Diocese of, of London have named the person who stole uh, millions of pounds. And uh, we had talked about this almost three months ago because they, they didn't name the name. We now don't know the name. What's the name, George? Martin Sargent, who was the head of the Two, of the two Cities Trust, uh, which is London has a lot of money and a lot of inherited wealth. And he was not the entire diocesan treasurer, but he was responsible for a portion of their finances. Mm -hmm. He has been arrested by the Metropolitan Police and accused of embezzling five million pounds over ten years. Gosh, they must have a lot of money to be able to have ten million, a uh, five million disappear and it took and them ten years it. to figure it out. Yeah. yeah. So, th actually, and this is also the fellow who started the rumor mill that led to the suicide of the priest that we discussed last week that the Diocese of London had to apologize, Martin Sargent, uh, as the, 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 uh, the gossip, if you will. And now he's being called a thief by the police and, oh, just a terrible situation in London. Yeah, I hope they get more information out of it, but uh, yeah, it's, it's terrible. It's hard to see. That's a lot of money that could be used for ministries, um, although you don't need money to have a successful ministry. Anglican TV, great example. Uh, Acton News, Bishop Todd Atkinson is going to trial. Yes, the uh, he would be presented on charges which have not been made public, as, except for the general, you know, conduct and becoming and this mm -hmm. and that. So we don't know what he did to who, what, when, where. 
Um, but the review board looked at the findings and they basically picked the most severe way forward. They didn't admonish him. They didn't say, oh, well, this is borderline. They said, no, you got to go to trial. Sure. So at trial, we should see the exact charges come out. Essentially, they're around spiritual and bullying charges of uh, creating some sort of cult of, around him. Although As I understand, I, 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 yeah. I, I, I could be totally we wrong. Know. Well, here's what normally happens is it goes to trial, something happens, and we get a phone call from the wonderful Andrew Gross, who's the uh, uh, press p person for the ACNA, and he explains everything that happened, everything they knew, when they knew it, what they knew, and then we get to tell you. So w we wait for that phone call from Andrew Gross as the trial proceeds. Um, quickly, we got one minute left here. Uh, armed Forces Episcopal Bishop fired. Nah, let go. No, quit. I, what's the story, George? We don't know. Mm -hmm. But Jeff Walton has been on this story, and he'll probably be breaking the news uh, sooner than uh, anybody else. Carl Wright was the Bishop of the Armed Forces of the Episcopal Church. And over the 4th of July weekend, uh, Todd Owsley, uh, the bis Bishop for Pastoral Development, one of the staff at 815, put out an announcement on behalf of the presiding bishop saying Carl Wright has resigned for health reasons. Over a holiday weekend, with no notice, and with nobody no, knowing that he was ho sick. Ho ho chaplain of the Armed Forces on a July 4th holiday weekend. Not just any holiday weekend, the one where we celebrate our nation's freedom. So, hmm. the, the rumor mills are buzzing away that no, this is not for health, and you know, pick a rumor that you want to find, but we'll let uh, Jeff Walton uh, fill us in what uh, what really is happening here, but that, that's all the signs point to more than just ill health. But we wait for the Episcopal Church or uh, the bishop himself to, to let us know what's going on. That's it for today's show. A full show. We went almost an entire hour talking about Anglican Christian news, and that's what we do here on Anglican Unscripted with Kevin Carlson and George Conger because we have nothing better to do than twice a week sit in front of our web cameras and tell you what we think about the news. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 741 of Anglican Unscripted.